But before I get out of the aircraft on this, you know, this first little flight, I like to just get a feel for how the aircraft handles so that once I especially get on the takeoff roll and just that first couple of minutes of flight, I'm not fighting the aircraft and I know what to expect. Now I have here on the, it's the Real Dash 1 flight manual, a section concerning flight characteristics. And I'll just sort of paraphrase some things right here. It tells us all about the maneuvering flaps, when they're used and what they do to increase lift. And in general, when the automatic system is going to use the flaps and when it's not, it also gives us information about maneuvering the aircraft. And I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this. So we're looking for above 360 knots to get to the structural limit as far as pulling G's on the aircraft. And by structural limit, I mean the maximum amount of G's the airframe can withstand without bad things happening and causing a lot of trouble and a lot of additional work for the maintainers on the ground. And judging by the red tick mark on the accelerometer, that's going to be a little bit above, looks like at about seven, seven and a quarter G. And to reach that, it says that we have to be above 360 knots. And below that, the amount of G that we can pull is going to be limited by the lift capability of the aircraft. And let me see, we're down to about 300 knots right now. So for example, if I were to, you know, just maintaining this power setting, I'll just put the aircraft into a bank, put the nose down slightly and pull. So 3G, 4G, 5, max at stick. And it tops out at 5G right there as I was getting into some pretty severe buffet. I think I was about to stall it out right there actually at that low airspeed that I entered that turn in. And it also incidentally tells us that about 24 units of AOA. So if I look over here to the AOA indexer, these are expressed in units as opposed to degrees. I don't know how many degrees a unit is in this case, but about 21 units is going to stall us. But you saw that, yeah, we got to about 5G before the aircraft just couldn't give us anything else. Now I'll plug in the burner. We're up above about 350. I'll put it into a bank. Okay, 360. I'll keep the nose low to accelerate now. Okay, 4G, 5G, 6G, 7G, 7 and a quarter, and I'll back off right there. And I didn't, I wasn't really paying attention to the AOA indexer, but I got into a lot of buffet and was probably close to stalling the aircraft again there. But yeah, you can see the difference that airspeed makes when it comes to the amount of uh, G loading that's available in the aircraft. I'm sure there are going to be points where we're capable of getting it even higher, but that red tick mark is absolutely as high as you want to go. Anything above that, and you've basically just taken the aircraft out of commission. I mean, do whatever you want, have fun with the aircraft, but in a real world situation, you would have taken the aircraft down for inspections and probably, you know, pulled about three or four maintainers off of other jobs just to go in and make sure that you didn't damage the aircraft. And, you know, that's something that you see every video that you hear. It seems like it's every video of anybody ever doing air to air, you hear over G just constantly. And I guarantee those folks, bless their hearts, don't know the consequences of what they're doing and how big a deal it is to over G an aircraft. It's not something to do lightly, but hey, again, there's no right or wrong way to do any of this. Have fun with the aircraft. And, and let me see here. I'll skip to, let me see, some notes on pitch, roll, and yaw authority. So we're going to have pitch authority all the way down to 100 knots indicated. And then as we go transonic, Mach 0.9 to Mach 0.95, we're going to have an increase in pitch sensitivity and you know just overall handling of the aircraft is very very i mean very responsive in pitch very responsive in roll and that is matching you know exactly what i'm reading here in the the section on control effectiveness now roll and yaw ailerons are going to be effective all the way up to about 20 units of aoa and i wasn't really paying attention to the aoa indexer as i was maneuvering the aircraft let me just put it into a, a bank okay so let me pull okay there's 10 units getting up to about 15. I'll pull it all the way to the stall above 20. And right there, we get into about a stall, I'll back off right there. So you get a, a, a very, very good warning. You can hear and feel the buffet, or I guess hear and see the buffet as you get above, it looks like about above 15 units. And that's, that's matching exactly what I'm reading here. And if I had exceeded that, I would have stalled the aircraft and uh, most likely lost control. So in either case, yeah, aileron control would have been effective all the way through that little maneuver that I did just then that matches what I was seeing when it came to maintaining control and roll. And then it says that rudder may be used throughout the flight envelope and it provides good roll control, particularly at low air speeds and or high AOA conditions. However, if the aircraft is flown to an AOA above stall, roll hesitations and oscillations will develop. So that's, well, that's telling me, okay, I'm about 350 right now. This is a test. Okay, yeah, plugging in some rudder, yes, yeah, taking the aircraft nose sort of left and right 
and then it sort of develops into a roll after that I believe what's going to happen here is once I get a little bit slower and this is sort of like simulating a landing approach right here it's probably a smart thing to do before I actually try to land this thing for real my first time out so I'm going to bleed off some speed I've got the speed brakes out I'm going to hold the nose off okay so there's level flight right there okay about 10 units of AOA I'm just checking the rudder yeah and it's yeah the roll uh, I believe what I'm seeing here is that the roll the slower you get becomes more and more apparent due to rudder use okay now we're getting into about 15 units of AOA I'll push it all the way up to about you know right up there I think that'll be sort of the speed and AOA for a landing approach and yes yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to tell I think what's going to happen there yeah I can see that as we get up especially to 20 units that that uh, aileron control is very very almost non-existent and yeah I think that's exactly what I would need to do there is if I am up around 20 units like I was and am right there then if I need to roll the aircraft I have a little bit of aileron control but I would need to augment that with rudder and that's yeah that's exactly what I was seeing back there and that's yeah pretty much matching everything that I would expect based on what I'm reading so so I'm going to knock that off right there I'm not one of those people that's going to get into high AOA situations and you know worry about how the aircraft handles post stall I mean if I get into that situation I have made a very very grievous mistake at some point I don't want to be anywhere above like the high teens in the AOA units and it says right here let me see uh, maximum lift capabilities attain near stall AOA so that's going to be like high teens 20 21 22 units of AOA and then stall occurs at approximately 24 units so if I get anywhere above 20 units of AOA I am grossly mishandling the aircraft at that point and I don't really care what it does once I get the aircraft departed I have no intention of ever doing that other than by mistake so therefore I'm not going to spend any time at all on that I know other people enjoy that sort of a flight but yeah I really honestly don't care but if you do want to get into it there is a section right here on spin behavior what I'm going to do here is get out of the aircraft and start to get into systems and that's going to involve getting onto the ground and running through the startup and I find that you can learn probably more about how the systems work during the startup process more than any place else because you're starting from scratch there so you know we have the radar up and running we have the RWR up and running but at this point I have no idea how I got to this point what mode it's in and what other systems have to be running on the aircraft for everything else to work and that's where getting into the startup procedure and really taking your time there and watching what happens as you go not just performing the steps but really understanding what's happening as you perform the steps and why you're performing them in the order that you're performing them in that's where you learn an aircraft and that's where you really get an idea of what's going on around you and now as we're getting into the startup and the takeoff I'm coming back to the main menu because there are two key pieces of information for the takeoff that I want to get out of the mission editor before we press on and that's going to be the proper trim preset to have set up for the takeoff roll and also a takeoff speed that I can use to tell me when to pull back on the stick or rotate and when the aircraft is going to lift off but I guess first just to check off the block of showing what's included with the aircraft here let me go through the interface and we'll see what kind of missions and what kind of options we have and I'll start up here at the options tab and if I come to the special sub tab and then select F5 I'm going to have the option for AI helper admission start and I believe what this does is it includes some overlays that will help you along with the startup process if you have this enabled but I'm going to leave that disabled for now customized cockpit we only have one option and that's the default English language cockpit and then side camera mode we have off only for tracks and on and this is a feature that if enabled whenever you fire the gun it captures a little bit of footage that's sort of in the style of gun camera footage. I might play around with that. I've done it before on the, I think I did it in the F-86 and MiG-15 test flights, but I've just never really found a good use for it in my videos, so I'm going to leave that for now off. We might have a look at that later. So that's it for the special options. For instant action, you've seen me in the free flight instant action. We also have cold start, takeoff, intercept, ground attack, air to air, and I'll be coming back to the cold start here in just a moment. We don't have any single missions designed for the F-5 at this point, but again, it is early access, so surely some of those are coming, and we also do not have a campaign at this point. Although the release notes did mention campaigns in development, I have no more information than that, so 
Again, it is early access, but hopefully that stuff does develop and develop soon. I, I really, really want to fly some missions in this aircraft that aren't just the instant actions, but uh, that'll come in time. And we also have under training, and this aspect of it is in a very, very complete state. We have, it looks like, nine training modules available, and these will just take you through step by step. Well, basically everything that I'm going to go through in the rest of the series, except I'm obviously going to go into a lot more detail. This will just give you step by step how to do some things, but yeah, we're going to have a closer look at the aircraft as we go. But these, I would recommend if you're learning the aircraft, are a very, very good first step. So now, let's go ahead and start to dig into this mission. Now, I'm going to fly the cold start instant action mission, but I'm not going to access it through the instant action interface because that's not going to give me access to the editor and some weights that I need. I'm going to come down to the mission editor and then open it up and I'm going to navigate to F5E and then F5E quick start cold start and open this one. Now this is where I'm going to start to get the information I need. So here's my aircraft on the Tbilisi Lucini airport. I select it. If I come over to the payload tab this is where we're going to go to choose our weapons and to get some weight data that we need. All I'm going to do with this data for our purposes here though is calculate my takeoff and rotation speed and also calculate the center of gravity position on the aircraft and that's going to give us the proper trim setting to have preset for the takeoff roll. So let's see here, right now we have an empty aircraft so let me pick something a little bit more appropriate. I'll go with two M9 P5s and I'll go with a single center line 275 gallon fuel tank. So for now, let's just keep it that simple and make it easy for us to handle on this first flight. Now we see over here to the right that we have a whole lot of weight information thrown at us. The one that I'm going to be most concerned about for this is going to be the total weight, 17,937 pounds, call it 18,000 pounds. So with that, let me go ahead and go to the Dash 1 flight manual. This is going to have all the charts and all the information that we need to calculate what we need to calculate. Now, let's start with getting the center of gravity position. Now, I'm going to start right here, and this is on page 2-9 of the version that I'm using and that I have linked in the video description. Now, it says pitch trim increments for optimum takeoff performance, and then it gives settings, let's say for example that the center of gravity figures out to 16, it's between 14 and 18, therefore on our pitch trim we would set that to 7 increments on a little gauge that we'll see once we get going. But what I need to do is be sure of the percentage that our center of gravity position is at. Now in the manual that comes with the module from the designer, there is a little quick reference sheet that you can use to kind of cheat and then based on you know missiles and a centerline tank it'll give you well it'll just give you the increments to set it to but i want to see what that's derived from i want to see how you actually calculate this so i'm going to do it for our purposes once and we start getting into the weight calculations and center of gravity calculations at page a1-6 and we see mean aerodynamic cord and it's just basically center of gravity position the lower the percentage the more forward the center of gravity is, the higher the percentage, the more aft the center of gravity is. And as that center of gravity starts to get more and more aft, the performance of the aircraft is going to start to change considerably and you start getting into some out of control situations the further aft it gets. If it goes beyond the limit, you're in trouble. Now the chart we go to to figure this is on A1-11. If we come up here to the top, we have a number of charts that basically do the same thing, but I'm looking for the one with the effectivity number of E-3. That's the model of aircraft that we have, and that's the chart that's going to apply. So let's go ahead and start to run through this. If this doesn't interest you at all, I mean, feel free to skip ahead. I just want to, especially as I'm learning the aircraft, understand this sort of thing. So I start by getting the weight of the aircraft. I need to figure out what the weight of my outboard station stores is, the weight of my inboard station stores is, and then the weight that's on the centerline station. Now, for this loadout, I only have the AIM-9s and a centerline 275 gallon tank, so my inboard and outboard pylon stations don't have anything, so I can skip that and only worry about the centerline weight. So I have a 275 gallon fuel tank, so if I come back to the weight data, okay, so I know that I have a centerline pylon at 170 pounds, so let's just start with 170. And then for fuel, I need to come to the next page. I'm going to have weight data based on the different types of fuel. I believe it's JP-8 that is going to be modeled here. So I come down here, external fuel, center line with 275 gallons. So fuel weight, 1843. And then I need to add the weight of the empty tank and that's 229 for this empty 275 gallon. 
And that means that my total standard line station weight is going to be 2242. I come to the chart. And I'm going to start right here at the index point. I need to take this out of read mode to do this. And what I'm going to do is just draw a line from the index point down to the point where on the scale it matches 2242. So I come up here to the top, cumulative, external, and pylon weight. So 2242 will be right about there where my cursor is. I come on down and just end the line right there. So that's actually going to tell me my baseline center of gravity position. So I take the line all the way across to the right so I can start with the baseline of about 13.8 uh, mean aerodynamic core. So I'm just going to start with you know 13.8. Just have that standing by because we need to do some math based on ballast weight, based on the A9s, and then based on the ammo load. What I do here is from the point where it intersects 2242 for that center line weight, I need to draw a line straight down to the ballast weight. Now I'm going to assume that this is modeled without the variable nose ballast because the ballast is only used if you have inboard station fuel tanks installed. So I'm just going to draw the line straight through the without variable nose ballast line. And that's going to take me down to the tip launchers. Now when I get there, I need to follow the line down to the right because I do have the launchers installed. And that's going to tell me that I need to add about uh, one half percent. So let's go ahead and go plus 0.5. So right now we're sitting at 14.3. From that point, I need to draw the line down to the ammunition sort of top baseline line. And then since I have a full ammo load, you can see over here, 100% gun load, I need to make another line from that point following the line down diagonally to the 560 round point. I followed this all the way around to the right, and that's going to tell me that I need to subtract about, oh, about 3.6%. Let's go minus 3.6. So our final aircraft center of gravity, this is all just approximate. There's uh, actually a much, much more complex way to do this. If you've uh, ever had the privilege of getting into aircraft weight and balance as a uh, yeah, in whatever capacity. So 10.7% mean aerodynamic cord is going to be what we're at. So if I go back to my chart, it was, I believe it was page 2-9. So 10.7 falls between 10 and 13. So I'm going to be looking for eight increments. So I'm going to preset that and I'll find it here in the manual for a visual. So here it is in the DCS manual. So pitch trim, it'll be eight increments up on this gauge. And the quick reference sheet for the same function I was talking about is going to be right here, page 195, and I guess mine doesn't exactly match what I would have expected right here, but I don't think it's going to make a whole heck of a lot of difference. Uh, for example, fuel tanks, ammo, and missiles is what I would have gone with. Just reading the DCS manual, that tells me 14 to 18, and just to set it to seven. I I just actually went back and double checked my calculation. It's, it's 10.7 for this exact loadout. So I guess I stand by my calculation, but again, I, I really don't think it's going to make a whole heck of a lot of difference either way. And I really am probably never going to come back here and really uh, do it to this detail again. Okay. So that's center of gravity. That's the pitch trim setting. So now I also need to use this center of gravity calculation in addition to the aircraft total gross weight to calculate my takeoff speed. So I come on down, you can see that there are just no limit to the things that you can calculate. I mean, I'm barely even scratching the surface here. It may seem like I'm going into depth, but I can assure you there's a lot more to it than uh, just what I'm doing here. So I'm going to come to here, A2-19 in this version of the manual, and this is at stick, takeoff, and obstacle clearance speed. I'm just going to do the at stick and the takeoff, or in other words, the rotation speed, and then the speed at which I'm going to get airborne. So I start down here at the gross weight, expressed in thousand pounds, it's on the top graph. I had calculated that, or I had got from here, 17,937, and I know that I'm going to actually bleed off a lot of fuel, maybe, I don't know, 400, 3, 400 pounds of fuel from startup to taxi, maybe a little bit more actually on this flight, so I'm just going to come down to, I don't know, about, uh, about 17,5 or so and just go with that. So starting down here, I just draw a line straight up. Now I need to find 10.7 on the CG line. So I can just sort of extrapolate it down to right about there. That's about 10.7. And then I draw a line directly across to the left from that. And that's going to put my takeoff speed 
right at 165 that's actually a lot faster than i thought it would but you know then again that is that is normal uh, for an f5 i'm sure so 165 is the takeoff speed and then it tells me up here that my aft stick speed or this speed at which i start to rotate to pull back on the stick is 10 knots less than the takeoff speed so i want to rotate at 155 and that's going to just put me right on the mark. Just as I rotate and the nose starts to come up, I'm going to hit 165, the takeoff speed, and that's when I'm going to get airborne. So there, again, is no limit to the amount of things that you can get into. You can get into climb data, you can get into fuel performance, range information back here. But yeah, I'm just going to hit those very, very simple things. And I, I need a break. I've been at this for longer than you've seen, uh, going through and double and triple and checking numbers here. But uh, I'll be back in the next video, we'll get into the aircraft, we'll get her started up and we'll get her airborne with this loadout, and then I have a number of skins I can use. I'm going to pick one, yeah, this one, the uh, the gray and the, uh, yeah, sort of two-tone gray aggressor skin. I've seen this in screenshots, and I'm going to go with this one for this flight. So, okay, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.